There's a lot of talk about the ketogenic diet and cancer and, ah, oh, you know, sugar feeds cancer. I think it's a gross oversimplification. It's not just about the fuel. It really is about all the other side effects and one of them, as we saw, literally, was um, reduction of antigenesis. And that's a major hallmark of cancer and it's obviously huge if you can, you know, get that under control. And we saw that, that you know, really those blood vessels, you know, they stopped growing and now I mean, they, they don't, they're not really visible on the, um, on the scans and, or the photographs and uh, everything has really calmed down and a lot of the side effects that I had had from the radiotherapy, um, they, w they are really well managed now. So I still have my vision, mm. although in 2010 the consultant um, told me, oh well, within 12 to 18 months, you know, prepare yourself, that vision will be gone. Hey friends, it's Mike Mutzel with High Intensity Health. Thanks for showing up and tuning back into another episode. I'm very excited today to be with Patricia Daly. She's the author of The Ketogenic Kitchen and we're gonna talk about her cancer survival story. And she's a nutritional therapist that focuses a lot in helping people uh, with cancer and so forth. And so we're gonna kind of explore that. And so Patricia, maybe we can open up with, uh, I think you were an, a very early adopter uh, and kind of, came about, um, looked at the original research in epilepsy and, and, and uh, spoke with individuals in Switzerland and Germany, scientists, and there wasn't the Dominic D'Agostinos and all the podcasts about ketosis back <laughs> when you were discovering this. So I'd love to yeah. kind of peel the onion back a little bit and talk about some of the, the impetus for you to embark on a ketogenic diet in the context of cancer recovery. Yeah, sure. So basically, when I had my relapse in 2010, I was originally diagnosed in 2008, it was a big blow to me and um, I had made a lot of changes uh, in terms of nutrition and also lifestyle but clearly it wasn't working. I mean the tumour was actually bigger than the first time round when I had the relapse and um, I did my conventional treatment again, proton beam radiotherapy of the eye, so my tumour is in, in the eye, it's a, an ocular melanoma and uh, obviously was really frustrated with how things were going for me and I was researching again after feeling low <laughs> for a few weeks and went back into research. I, I really looked again at different approaches that I had already looked at and then I came across um, the University Clinic uh, of Würzburg, um, Ulrike Kammerer who is still very heavily involved in uh, ketogenic research and she had a handout there and uh, about the ketogenic diet and you know the main mechanisms and how it could work and just very rough guidelines on how to implement it and uh, so from there then I moved on to uh, the research done by Dr. Coy also in Germany so a lot of it was in German so I was lucky to actually have German because I'm Swiss oh, brilliant. Um, so I didn't need to um, hire a translator and I just started to implement what, what they were saying my only in my sort of only issue was that I wasn't very good at tolerating dairy. Um, I had quite a lot of um, gut problems at the time. I had always had them and it wasn't obviously it was made worse with a lot of surgery. I had surgery three times and lots of you know local anesthetics. I had two biopsies plus then the radiotherapy so um, I had had a right hammering. So uh, I knew dairy wasn't really great so that was a bit of a problem because it was very dairy focused. So very quickly I realised that I had to um, like create my own unique um, approach. And as you said, you know, there, there wasn't that much information at the time, but I was already a qualified nutritional therapist. So uh, I knew what I was doing. Plus I had the support of my consultant who said, you know, I do whatever I need to do to monitor. I give you a few weeks um, because I was really pushed to the edge. Um, I, ha I was supposed to have a Vastin injections into the eye, which is an angiogenesis inhibitor. So that was one of my main problems. There was excess angiogenesis, so the growth of um, blood vessels to supply the tumour. And that gave us the suspicion, okay, what's, what's going on? Why are these blood vessels growing? Is there something happening again with the tumour? And they were just about to really take other measures because radiotherapy hadn't worked. Um, and uh, the other option that they gave me was, okay, we can just take the eye out, that's the other option. option. And I was um, 
I think I was I wasn't even 31 I was probably 30 I had an eight month old boy and a two and a half year old girl I said oh that would be that would be a big thing and I would like to avoid that if I possibly can and also injections on a regular basis so uh, my consultant gave me some time uh, some grace thank goodness <laughs> and uh, so that's what I did and the interesting thing in in my case is that you can actually see what's going on you can see the tumor and the tumor environment and I think when uh, you know people talk about there's a lot of talk about a ketogenic diet and cancer and ah oh, you know sugar feeds cancer I think it's a gross oversimplification it's not just about the fuel it really is about all the other side effects and one of them, as we saw, literally, was um, reduction of antigenesis. And that's a major hallmark of cancer and is obviously huge if you can, you know, get that under control. And we saw that, that, you know, really those blood vessels, you know, they stopped growing and now, I mean, they, they don't, they're not really visible on the, um, uh, on the scans and, or the photographs and uh, everything has really calmed down and a lot of the side effects that I had had from the radiotherapy, um, they, w they are really well managed now. So I still have my vision, mm -hmm. although in 2010 the consultant um, told me, oh well, within 12 to 18 months, you know, prepare yourself, that vision will be gone. Because Just in the one eye? Right. In this, okay. in in the right eye, yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> the main reason is also that they had to radiate the optic nerve because the tumor had grown so close to the optic nerve, and they have to have this margin of error. So they had to radiate um, the optic nerve as well. And we saw that also on the um, ocular CTs and on the on the photographs um, that the tumor, um, that the optic nerve was, um, you know, not doing well. <clears throat> and uh, so the vision had started to tunnel in. And um, you know I had lost a lot of it, but but it, it actually came back. Wow. And uh, yeah. So you even overcame some of the radiation-induced <clears throat> damage on the nerve, which is pretty profound. Yeah, yeah. So that's where we have the other effect, you know, the other neurological effects potentially mm -hmm. of the ketogenic diet. I think I just hit the nail. Um, you know, with with that approach, I was very lucky, and uh, I completely acknowledge that it might not be the same for everyone, but in my case, it just. Um, worked beautifully. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So maybe the anti-inflammatory properties associated with the ketones and maybe um, brain-derived neurotrophic factors, some of these growth factors help to repair the nerve potentially? Is that what you were kind of surmising? Yeah, I mean that's that's the, that's the assumption, yeah. yeah. And also the other interesting thing was that the primary tumor in the eye had spread to outside the eye and it was about six millimeters in diameter and um, it was last scanned in 2012 and it remained unchanged after the radiotherapy so it just didn't um, didn't grow but it didn't shrink it was just still there and yeah. it was very much um, a tumor and uh, I had a, a scan then again in 2015 and it's completely gone wow there's not even scar tissue it's or amazing anything. yeah Wow. So that is cool. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah, it's yeah. brilliant, as we'd say in, in Europe. Yeah, um, I think something that's unique to go back a little bit. What you said right there is it's not just all about the sugar and so-called the Warburg effect. The other mm -hmm. hallmark features of cancer, like angiogenesis and, and EGF and other things, if we want to reduce the growth of cancer naturally, you know, ameliorate those, you know, slow those processes down. And so I think that's really this kind of metabolic signature that's created via low blood glucose, low blood insulin, and possibly high ketones together concomitantly mm -hmm. has these positive effects on the network of the cancer cell. I think that's really important. And yeah. um, would the, what other kind of network effects, because I know that's, we were talking a little bit earlier offline about the exogenous ketones, um, but is that what got you excited? Have, have these network effects associated with ketosis? W were these German researchers elucidating some of that back in 2010, 2012, when you were looking at the research? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, um, Dr. Coy, he's uh, the discoverer uh, of the TKTN1 gene. And so I already knew then there's, there was something going on with epigenetics and, you know, gene expression and, uh, you know, certain tumor markers that can be influenced. So that's what he is heavily involved in. And, you know, anybody who wants to look at that, I really encourage them to, you know, explore those papers by, by him as well and didn't go that far at the time. Yeah. I think for me, when I started, it was mainly, okay, let's, you know, I, I just, re I think the whole insulin glucose reduction, insulin reduction, 
Um, that made a lot of sense to me at the time. And I, I guess I was just in, in such a difficult situation um, that I literally had nothing to lose. I, I think I would have just beaten myself up if I hadn't tried it mm -hmm. because um, what could have gone possibly wrong, really? Because I was monitored, I did my, my blood tests and uh, you know, I, I went every four weeks um, to have a look at the, at the eye, what was going on. If I hadn't had any response, I probably would have given up. But because the response was so clear within a very short amount of time for me, I mean, my consultant said, yep, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. Great. And uh, keep carry on, carrying on. And that's, you know, that's what's that now? Seven years on. It's amazing. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's really fantastic. Or five years, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Since 2012. Congratulations. Mm. That's a huge Thank testimony you. to, you know, just eating a healthy, clean diet. I mean, irrespective possibly of ketosis, it can really help the body. You know, we hear a lot about that. But going back to the dairy comment on the German researchers, why was there, were they, their science that they were doing, was it in the context of epilepsy? And why was dairy kind of a focus? Uh, it was in the context of uh, cancer mm -hmm. as well, but I think it's it's just a you know German and Swiss <laughs> culture. No yeah, and it's yeah. ideal. It's it's you know protein and fat combined. And at the time, I remember I did the protein. I think I just kept it as simple as possible. I think it was just twenty grams with each meal, and mm -hmm. uh, you know just really really simple, and just had a f you know the protein sources that I needed. I knew about the carbs, and then I just topped up with the fat. So I, I really didn't, you know, like I have those sophisticated recipes now. <laughs> I didn't do all that. <laughs> that that just came. Creativity then came after sort of the. Um, you know the firefight literally yeah. and I didn't really have time to create all those um, fancy uh, recipes and I still you know there's times where I just it's very very simple and when I have time I make more sophisticated stuff but right. yeah it was just the, the dairy I think is it's just in the culture um, but f you know for me in terms of digestion and as we know now as well Possibly, you know, certain dairy products um, uh, can elicit a higher insulin or IGF response as well. And we do know that insulin is, um, is a growth factor uh, for cancer. So um, that's why I sort of start, uh, started to also look into, into that and reducing it. I mean, it's not, doesn't mean I have no dairy. Right. <laughs> Context dependent. Yeah. I mean, I tolerate it okay again now, thank goodness. Yeah. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, so I knew from your, your talk back at the metabolic therapies in Tampa, you were talking mm. about the different insulinogenic nature of proteins. Mm. And I think a lot of people don't think that when in the keto world or low carb world, when we hear about protein, we hear about gluconeogenesis and too much protein you know, mm. can back create glucose and whatnot. But um, I find it very interesting, the insulinogenic nature of different proteins. And, you know, you wanting to really kind of salvage your eye, if, we, if you will, um, got really specific about different proteins and figured out like which mm. proteins you could and couldn't have and things like that. So um, let's explore that. I think that's pretty unique about like which if someone's trying to be really hardcore keto, whether it's diabetes mm. or cancer, neurologic issues, um, you know, epilepsy and things, which proteins have you found over the years of doing this that are like no, no, or some are good or what have you? Mm. I mean, it's definitely, as always, a bit of an individual response as well. So um, if you feel that all of a sudden your, your ketones have gone, it could be because of an insulin response because they're antagonists. Uh, so that's sort of the first sign or that's the best way for people to actually test. But there are foods that uh, definitely have a, a higher insulinogenic um, factor so, or percentage. So Marty Kendall actually, he's based in Australia, he has done lots of research into this and uh, you know he sort of really pulled it all together, what I just sort of applied a little bit yeah. um, based on, on, on experience. And uh, there's even uh, a formula that uh, came up and we can probably put that in, in the show notes for sure. people who are very interested in it. And uh, so there's basically, um, as a rule of thumb, obviously, you know, carb rich foods, they tend to elicit a, a higher insulin response, but it's not just about the carbs, as you said, it is um, the type of protein. And it, it appears that, um, you know, for instance, low fat, low fat dairy actually is more insulinogenic or low fat uh, meats as well. So for instance, um, very lean fish or very lean meat, they tend to be more insulinogenic as mm -hmm. well. And uh, so if you combine, so say for instance, eggs or uh, bacon as well, or oily fish would obviously be a very good choice. Um, and then also olives, avocados, um, 
and also cream butter they would have um, a much lower um, insulinogenic uh, effect and I even now in um, I've helped develop an app um, with uh, Senza, I don't know, you probably met them in, in Tampa as well. So, yeah. And we even now have uh, the insulin load, um, you can calculate the insulin load of, of a day of, of your, your food. That's so, brilliant. and then just see trends and see if there's a correlation with your ketones or glucose. And I think, I mean, a bit of a nerd that way, mm -hmm. just to <laughs> see where are correlations and how does it all work together. And um, so it's, it's fascinating, yeah, just to go into those little nuances as well. Obviously, once somebody's got the hang of the, uh, you know, sort of the basics of the ketogenic diet, I think for me it's important then to fine tune and and tailor it to to a yeah. person. Brilliant. And what's the name of the app? It's called Sensa. Sensa. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. I was. Yeah. I know there's a chronometer too that's been popular and that they're at all the conferences. So I wasn't yeah. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Chronometer is cool as well. All right. Yeah. We'll put that in the show notes as well. So uh, really good tip. Yeah. Um, one thing about the insulin load that sometimes doesn't really get talked about as much. I know Jason Fung talks about it quite a bit is meal frequency and how many meals you're having through the day because every, you know, if you're having protein and little carbs, we're going to spike insulin and repetitively mm. might have an iterative effect and, and yeah. so forth. So what have you found um, in terms of meal frequency and like, were you fasting for a longer period of time when you were first getting into this mm -hmm. and, and how did that look? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question because I was one of those grazers. I was one of those every two hours a little bit eating. And uh, for me, it was a huge change to even just go from that to three meals, three square meals. That was that was a big one. And, uh, you know, it took me some time to get used to. And I remember when I was uh, I was a, a triathlete and I had to go for regular blood tests um, as part of that as well on the Swiss um, team, national team as a junior and uh, I remember having to cycle to those blood tests fasted and nearly nearly Eight. not making it. Yeah, I mean really, really and I, I, would, I would love to actually dig out those tests and just check what my figures were and my fasting glucose and all that. I'll, I'll track them down someday. Uh, but I find it really hard to do anything without food. And I always carried food with me. So for me, that was a big change. And then I think after about a year or so, I, I came across intermittent fasting and just found it really easy then. Actually, when my, when my daughter started to go to preschool, I realized it was just too busy in the morning to, to eat. And it sort of suited my lifestyle to skip breakfast. And that's how I got into intermittent fasting. And just, I usually have sort of a fasting window of 16 to 18 hours. So oh, around, wow. around that. And it depends a bit on the monthly cycle as well. Um, it does vary a little bit. Uh, sometimes it's just, it's always at least 14 hours. That's sort of my, my rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. and, and then um, uh, sometimes it's longer. Sometimes I do 24 hour fasts. And um, so it's, it's really also on my subjective feeling or if I feel, okay, as you say, you know, with um, insulin or glucose, let's just really bring it down and um, yeah, take, take a good break from food. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> awesome. And activity level too. So if you're really active mm. and working out, you need more calories, right? It's not a good time to always fast. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's really brilliant. You know, yeah. I used to be the same way. So. Uh, you know, in the cycling and, and endurance community, we would say things like eat, eat, train early, eat early, sleep early, right? So um, are you one of those where you kind of like squish, you skip breakfast or you're having like lunch and then an early dinner and then fasting from there? Or how does that look now? Yeah, generally? it's interesting. I've experimented with quite a lot of things. I've tried to have breakfast sort of around nine and then uh, dinner at two or three. And that would actually be perfect for me. But mm -hmm. It's just family. really, yeah, exactly. They <laughs> yeah. put a spanner in the works. And I just love sitting down with the family and having this family meal. And I think we always have to weigh that up. I know that, you know, probably physiologically and, you know, looking at everything, this sort of nine and two would work really well for me. But it's just with the family, it can be hard. Yeah. Um, and especially then also when, when, you know, when I want to have a meal out, then it, it, it throws that out. But generally, I try to just have dinner really early. Uh, we eat uh, at six and then that's it mm -hmm. and then I have uh, I mean today was really late breakfast at, at, at one oh, <laughs> but wow. that was a bit unusual and I'm really super busy I just uh, I almost then at some point as you say you know you have to at some point get the calories in mm -hmm. but um, yeah just 
could actually go go without and sometimes I do that for 24 hours but yeah that's awesome a bit, yeah. once a month or something along those lines or? generally yeah, yeah just to, I try to do it once a month yeah yeah exactly yeah it's funny you were mentioned that the blood work when you're on the Swiss site was it the Olympic team it was a triathlon. It was just the, the junior national team. Junior I was national, never on the Olympic team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm a little Didn't simplified. Make it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, would have been nice. <laughs> brilliant. Well, I used to be very, very similar to that in the sense like doing anything fasted or any exercise fasted was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do that. So it was mm. always a banana or frozen fruit or uh, dried fruit, things like that. So it's amazing yeah. now, you know, I'm just as lean, even though I'm not exercising nearly as much, mm. but have much more metabolic flexibility and like that, that like the codependence on food uh, and then the, the thought of not of being without food and crashing doesn't even occur to me as, as you get more fat adapted so I think it's mm. it's a nice mental freedom for people because uh, you know if you're doing the traditional bodybuilding you know high protein very low carb you have like six seven meals a day you're always like wondering about meal prep where am I gonna eat yeah. like, can I bring this Tupperware and so that's in my opinion just the freedom uh, food definitely freedom. Yeah, yeah, that's that's made a huge difference. And I do know, I think nowadays, um, actually Alex Ferretti, I think he was working a bit with um, Jan van Berkel. Mm. And I actually remember him him when he was a very little boy. <laughs> and uh, Alex did, yeah, he wow. was just in a blog post recently. And uh, he did a bit of work with him because he, I think his... Um, visceral fat was, was a little bit elevated and also uh, triglyceride triglycerides and just generally you know there was a bit of um, work to do it was going towards insulin resistance I think as, as far as I remember from the article and uh, he also you know went then into the whole fat adaptation and doing long really slow bike rides fasted and that's mm. what I would do now if, yeah. um, <laughs> if I could go back goodness what's that now almost 20 years <laughs> yeah. yeah when I was on on the team and um, I know that more and more athletes are doing this, endurance athletes, and it's not necessarily, they're not necessarily on a low carb or ketogenic diet, but they do their long, low intensity stuff fasted first thing in the morning. And uh, I think that's, that's a pretty good idea. It's mm -hmm. a good start. Yeah. Mm. I used to do that when I would train and do like about 200 watts for about two hours and it seemed to really, that capillary density, and so you're really relying on that mitochondrial function for that long, slow stuff. Is that kind of mm. the idea to really train that and then utilize fat for fuel? Yeah, exactly. That? Yeah. I think yeah. that's sort of the main, um, my main idea, the whole fat burning. And I remember we used to talk about that, that when you hit the wall after an hour or so, that you have used up all your your glycogen. glycogen yeah and uh i remember, <laughs> I remember like, that yeah exactly yeah. yeah so i don't know if i um was a good fat burner or not so <laughs> probably not the best it's interesting like you know back then right if you were training on a lot of carbs and you know eating all the time i think you just your body gets dependent upon utilizing that substrate mm. for fuel um even in some of the lower intensity stuff that's just my interpretation after kind of yeah, and I think more and more uh, endurance athletes are going towards insulin resistance, mm -hmm. interestingly. And when I look at my symptoms, um, you know, it, uh, it, could, it could have well been that I was insulin resistant. Yeah. And, uh, you know, especially then later on when I didn't train that much anymore and still ate the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Yeah, <laughs> that's the hardest thing, right? If you're training a lot, you tend to eat a lot of food. Oh, yeah. And then once you yeah. stop training, you're like, oh, I have to change this. And then yeah. <laughs> some people like train because they eat so much, so they get into it. You yeah, know, yeah, it's a suspicious circle. Yeah. Almost. yeah, exactly. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of that, let's talk about kind of what you're doing now. So I know that you're training a lot more than maybe you were. Uh, and so how have you been doing carbohydrate cycling in that context to kind of help with your performance potentially? Yeah, I was really uh, sort of getting into resistance training uh, sort of for the past maybe two or three years. I really was working a bit more on that rather than the endurance and aerobic. I just sort of felt um, also at my, my age, you know, muscle mass is starting to go downhill. And uh, also when I started going keto, I just thought, you know, in terms of the uh, block glucose, if I do, you know, long, pretty intense workouts, that's probably not the best idea. So I really changed my exercise uh, routine and did quite a bit more resistance training mm -hmm. and still some cardio, but really more just very, very low uh, intensity, like, you know, walking or cycling, cycling the kids around in the cargo bike and um, stuff like that. And then last uh, November, December, I was uh, diagnosed with a hemorrhage in my eye. 
and um, did a bit of research and it looks like uh, it can put a lot of pressure even doing squats or overheads it can put an enor enormous amount of pressure um, on the eye so um, I have to I'm back to square one again <laughs> so no, okay uh, what suits me best and what really fulfills my needs because I, I love movement I've always been a very active person before triathlon I did competitions in rhythmic gymnastics oh, wow. and then 14 I started triathlon um, so it's just really I'm very in a big part of my life and I there's something missing so I'm still searching a bit what the best balance is I'm swimming quite a bit again cool. and that seems to you know be what, what I need at the moment swimming walking and every morning at the moment I do um, so it's sort of a yoga routine it's the five Tibetan right cool. and uh, so I'm, I'm doing that as well and trampoline actually mm, we have right. a trampoline in the garden yeah. and uh, I do a lot quite a lot of that be it without the kids first thing in the morning when they're in school or then sometimes in the evening as well with the kids and it's just great for getting the lymph going and it's brilliant exercise actually and yeah it's fun I, it's good I mean you get your heart rate and your, your breath yeah. kind of out of breath in just a short period of time yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and I do all kinds of funny maneuvers yeah it's so awesome it's really cool and I think we should let everyone know that you actually biked here which to this interview in Dublin which is really cool is it about a 30 minute ride for you or 20 or uh, yeah, I got lost on the way, so yeah. it ended up about 30, no <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so you're the first, so, so we, we're at episode, I don't know, close to 200 now, and you're the first person that's biked to, like, meet each other. So congratulations, it's really fun. Cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I cycle everywhere, yeah. if, if possible, because uh, traffic is, is so bad. Yeah, in, in, Dublin. in Dublin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you're much that. faster on the bike. Totally. Plus you're getting your exercise. And, yeah, and yeah. fresh air. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Awesome. Okay, so um, on the carb thing, are you doing like carbs before like training sometimes, after, or? I usually train fasted. So yeah. when okay. I do that in the morning, you know, um, if it's low intensity, a walk or swimming is sometimes in the afternoon. And then I do, uh, I do a bit of, you know, sprints and uh, sort of, well, it's not sprints, it's sort of 50 meters really full speed mm -hmm. um, and do that maybe eight to ten times so a bit of high intensity um, and then I just but I don't I don't actually have carbs before I just oh well I have all in all I have maybe about sort of 30 grams of neck carbs mm -hmm. sometimes it's um, max 50 but I don't go beyond 50 and uh, I don't really notice any difference whether I have carbs or not yeah. you know in terms of um, performance it's probably because I don't compete or you know I just really do it for for health and uh, of course I always have uh, an eye on on the time yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you can't help yeah. help yourself after competing for so long and uh, yeah so but I don't really you know watch a lot for you know targeted carbs or anything I don't think I need it at the moment but sure. maybe if I if ever I decide to compete again then I'll pay a lot more attention to to that, of course, just to actually really from a performance perspective. But at the moment, that's not really the priority. Yeah. Or if you're doing really more explosive type work where the carb, like glycolytic metabolism was mm. only being utilized, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I do know some people, though, when they first get into this and they're exercising, they can kind of bonk earlier initially. Like yeah. we we're talking about. Um, you know, and you get that real like strong craving for sugar and you start to get lightheaded and things like that. Um, mm. Any tips for people? Does that kind of overcome over time? Do your clients tell you like, oh man, when I'm keto adapting, I sometimes get low blood sugar. Does that ever come up for you? Um, when they exercise or in general? Just in general, yeah. Just in general. Oh yeah, it can definitely, it can definitely happen that there's still a bit of a mismatch and uh, that the energy needs uh, sort of aren't quite quite met and sometimes at the beginning it can make sense to eat a bit more often or I think for me sort of the the three meals but some people they still need snacks at the yeah. beginning until it's it's really um, well well settled and they don't go into into this hypo uh, glycemia so uh, but I actually very rarely I must say uh, very rarely come across it and um, as far as I remember, I never had any sort of episodes because I, I know what it feels like yeah. <laughs> from previous times. So I never had, had this problem. But if, if somebody does, then yeah, definitely, you know, look into meal, meal frequency as well. And uh, I mean, that's when possibly, you know, the, the ketones, uh, the exogenous ketones or MCTs 
can can have have a place as well mm-hmm. um, but I would I would be very cautious with, with that especially with cancer patients yeah definitely mm-hmm. I definitely want to explore that a lot further but I think um, one thing you mentioned around your cycle your menstrual cycle mm-hmm. um, you know kind of changing male frequency possibly changing uh, carbohydrates uh, that question does come up a lot you know for, for ladies mm-hmm. and the confusion and you know some women really don't they say they don't do well in ketosis and things like that mm-hmm. um, and from some of the clients that I've worked at, worked with I wonder if there's an underlying insulin resistance that, that's going on that possibly like you were mentioning maybe they dove into it too fur too you know too intensely at first mm-hmm. and needed some of this mm-hmm. transition multiple meals maybe little snacks higher in fat in nature um have you found that to be true with your clients yeah i mean definitely there is a difference between men and women and uh I, I suspect generally uh, glucose is, is higher during, during the periods mm-hmm. and uh, that's what I, um, I see as well. I can't fast for as long. I do actually get, it's not cravings, but I do actually get sort of, mm, I need to eat now, mm-hmm. which sometimes I just, uh, you know, sort of mid-cycle, I would never have that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think ketones can also be lower and actually there's, um, I don't know if you've come across Elena uh, Gross, so G-R-O-S-S. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's been working quite a bit as well with Angela and uh, Dominic and she's in uh, Switzerland in Basel and she's just started a, a study into uh, migraines actually and using ketone supplements and she just did a little survey the other day for women actually do you re- you know do you does it happen to you as well and I do think it's it's quite it's quite common with the you know the hormonal changes that glucose actually does tend to to go up possibly also because of uh, the uh, glucocorticoids, the um, cortisol. And uh, so I definitely think around that time, uh, I wouldn't, you know, do any <laughs> experiments or sort of resist the, you know, the urge if, if there is sort of a need to, to eat. Otherwise, it can actually, you know, go into sort of, you know, pretty bad hypoglycemia or, or it goes, goes up and down uh, mm-hmm. a lot more, your, your blood sugars then. So uh, I would be more cautious around that time and just see if, if you can detect any, any patterns. And it's just a bit more volatile, <laughs> I mm-hmm. find. Yeah, and it's definitely individual as well. Right. So mm. if I kind of heard you correctly, like listen to your body and in one sense. You know, if you're having those cravings, oh, particularly yeah. around menses, yeah. you know, just then fine, have, have a little bit more energy, a little bit more carbs potentially from yeah. clean sources. Mm-hmm. I'll measure, measure glucose and see, see what actually is going on and how you can correct or mitigate it and definitely not oh no I'm on this I'm on this 16 hour fast now mm. and I just have to pull through although I can't focus on anything <laughs> so right. I mean I'm I can be that kind of person but I I've learned I've learned my lessons that um, you know also training plans and all of that sometimes you just have to um, let it go and it's the same with uh, if you are on a certain eating plan mm-hmm. it's still important to really uh, tune in and and then probably start logging and you know seeing patterns and it's it's, it's interesting um, and uh, and that can really help. Yeah, really good point. You mentioned training plans and there was one study where individuals um, like had to stick to the, this. I think was competitive cyclists. Just it's an analogy. I think or a study and an analogy of sorts that ties into what you just said. And then another group of individuals were following the same like power to weight ratio and training per day. But when they didn't feel like training, where they felt overtrained, they took rest breaks. Mm. And towards the end of the study, the group that actually kind of listened to their body was more intuitive. And when they felt burnt out or overtrained, they didn't push through. They just took a rest day. Mm. They performed much better in the next competition. Yeah, I'll have to put that link in the show. So I think it's really important for us to mm. take note of that. And one advantage of like testing things is you can see how other lifestyle factors like stress, like yeah. exercise, poor sleep affects mm. your blood glucose and ketone production. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's why I, I have the, the aura ring. Yeah. And, uh, and for, I'm a bit of the person who needs to see it before she believes it. Mm-hmm. And um, I sometimes still struggle with, okay, what do I really need? I'm definitely still on on that journey, and uh, not trying to just you know go with the wall through uh, the head through the wall, <laughs> and uh, just do or follow a certain protocol. Um, I would be that kind of personality if I have a plan. So it's probably the Swiss genes. I don't know, yeah. but um, it has its advantages and disadvantages. So the aura ring has really helped me in that I can actually see it, and then I do combine it with obviously 
how I subjectively feel. And so before I always, before I look at my data, I actually now have made a point in, okay, how do I feel? How do I think mm -hmm. uh, the aura ring, what do I think uh, the aura ring will tell me? And uh, it's, it's really interesting that I'm actually very rarely totally off the charts, you know, that I'm totally wrong. The aura ring tells me I had a great sleep, but I feel absolutely shattered. So mm -hmm. there's a nice correlation. And for me, it's, it's sort of um, a good, compromise in a way that uh, I really learned to uh, listen but I also have the data and uh, when there's a difference okay why is there a difference so yeah. um, I think certain tools can be very helpful others find them very stressful but mm -hmm. I definitely find them helpful. Brilliant. What are some of the things that you've figured out for yourself when it comes to sleep and, and things like that um, that affect it in a positive and or negative way? Yeah, when I, uh, before going to bed, when I'm in any way agitated or I've read something that upsets me or that really occupy, occupies my mind, um, it's immediate, or also during the day, if there's a lot going on uh, during the day, then it definitely affects um, my sleep. So it's all about, I think it comes back to meditation mm -hmm. and uh, uh, really, you know, uh, switching off from time to time and giving giving the mind mind a break. <laughs> because the mind is a curious thing and always busy. So um, for me, it's it's I'm actually doing a course at the moment as well, just to have loads of different tools and uh, really learning to when to utilize them. And uh, when I do get overwhelmed, okay, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And uh, I never really learned that as a child. I wish I had. So it's something that I um, I have to really learn, and I don't. I'm not very good at it, sort of um, intuitively. So it's I find that really helpful, especially before going to bed. It seems to be making the biggest difference, and uh, and also yeah, light. Uh, I do have blue blockers in in the evening. Um, when it's dark outside, yeah. and uh, now in the summer it's a bit different, but. That makes a big difference. Or if I eat late, oh, it's over. Yeah, it's, it's over. Tough. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so if I do go out and I eat late, I try to really keep it, you know, really, really small portions, mm -hmm. and that definitely makes a difference. I don't. It it affects deep sleep mainly. Mm. So deep sleep really reduces drastically if I have a large meal, say at you know past seven o'clock or eight o'clock. Um, that can that can make a di big difference to my deep sleep and then has an impact on my heart rate as well the resting heart rate and sometimes even body temperature mm. and then you know uh, then it's the next day sort of okay your readiness score yeah. <laughs> is, is pretty low so yeah timing is meal timing it definitely has an impact as well yeah, yeah. It's so fascinating. Yeah, we were talking mm. about this too with uh, Dr. Rangan Chatterjee about how you can have like a, a hangover from food, you know, where you feel like kind of hungover, like, oh, unrested and just from eating a little late. It's so, mm. so interesting. Mm. And we're trying to figure out like mechanistically, what is that? Are you like fermenting weird byproducts because your, your gut is kind of stagnant or is there just a lot of blood flow? I don't, it's kind of an interesting. I don't know if you've thought mm. about that. Yeah. Know, the mechanistically why why that would be but yeah i think uh, digestion is just has to come to a stop doesn't it mm -hmm. when we when we go to to sleep and then what's going on with all the food that is just um and and sometimes when you then wake up in the middle of the night you hear it going off yeah. like mad <laughs> and it's sort of okay we're awake so let's do our job no <laughs> yeah so yeah. i think that's uh, i mean there's probably lots of different um factors um going into into that and but the heart rate i'm not sure actually yeah why that kind of then goes up as well yeah yeah and i'll have to ask alessandro he does as you know a lot of hrv yeah. testing yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. and so forth so we'll talk to him about that um, yeah so so the aura ring really good for testing sleep and also activity right during the day yeah it's basically for me as well to because i am trying to do some high intensity and when i see oh god you know everything is down in the I don't know what percentages you know sort of under 70 or if readiness which sort of takes everything into account your sleep your previous activity levels heart rate temperature that gives you a readiness score and if that's sort of you know 70 75 then I prefer to take it easy when it's over 80 you know 85 even then I know okay um, uh, it's it's probably a good time to do some higher intensity so mm -hmm. that's what I use the 
um, for, from the activity and readiness perspective, that's what I use the ring as well. Brilliant. Uh, so that's it would have been so useful when I was competing because I quite often I actually managed to get myself a stress fracture mm. um, when I was 22 because I was wanted to do that one last uh, sort of a running block and had one last intense uh, training and I had this niggling in my foot mm-hmm. but I still went ahead and did it Post and then real. bang yeah knife yeah. in the foot Ooh, yeah brutal. really sore yeah and then you're out for six weeks oh my gosh <laughs> yeah past podcast guest Dr. Sarah Kinnan did the same thing rope yeah uh, self-induced exercise induced uh, yeah fracture, stress fracture yeah exactly yeah so uh, yeah, that's you know overriding the mind, overriding the uh, body. I'm very good at that, but I'm yeah. learning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm brilliant. I love that. So we talked about you know kind of tracking sleep, and then uh, we we're talking offline tracking ketones. You found that tracking with blood was a little expensive, so you found. Yeah, I used to do it definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, when you know, I mean, it's it's five years now, and I'm in officially in remission for seven years now. So. Um, I don't consider myself in in that really that I have to be constantly in that GKI of one or below the sort of glucose ketone index. So when you take your glucose in millimol per liter and divide it by the ketones, that gives you that particular index. And when you are doing ketogenic diet for therapeutic reasons, you should be, you know, ideally two or even one and and under. So um, I don't feel that that's really, you know, the first priority for me anymore. For me, it's really getting nutrients in, you know, as uh, having a nutrient density, but obviously still have, a, you know, a diet that allows me, allows me as much flexibility as possible in terms of, you know, metabolic flexibility. But as we said, I think earlier offline uh, these days, stress and sleep, has a much bigger impact than food on on my glucose levels so wow, it's, it's definitely you know i think we sort of move beyond that point where um i think where uh, you know food is it's one aspect and it's definitely important but there's other things that are equally important and um i think it's not often talked about and people are too focused someti- sometimes on food and, and then maybe um, neglect those other factors like stress reduction, sleep, and so yeah, forth. Yeah, or community. There mm-hmm. was this paper. <laughs> I don't know if you if you saw it. It's a brand new uh, paper. Can't remember the authors. I can I can uh, send you the link. But yeah, that community can actually you know be so beneficial that it cancels out a lot of the negative effects of diet and lifestyle errors or whatever. And uh, so I think yeah, these are all lifestyle aspects that we need to take into consideration as well and what makes us relaxed and and happy and you know having fun and um, that's some something that when you you know when you are working and you're trying to implement a certain dietary approach I can see that that can cause a lot of stress for people and um, if the stress is bigger than the benefits then you have to reconsider if it's a good approach definitely scary stuff that folks is, so yeah. get outside eat real food with friends and so forth yeah exactly yeah. and find find your tribe and totally. <laughs> yeah where they don't judge you when you don't eat yeah whatever macaroni <laughs> and cheese or something <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah brilliant uh mm-hmm. well let's kind of finish off with exogenous ketones and we we're talking offline about how you know, maybe uh, some people are using them as cheap pills of sorts and having pasta and bread or whatever and then taking the ketones and thinking, well, I'm still going to be a fat burner when I do this. And mm. in my eyes, we're kind of mimicking like uh, the signature of like diabetic ketoacidosis when we have like high glucose and high ketones. Yeah. How, why aren't you necessarily super excited about them? I mean, I'm definitely, you know, following the research very, very closely and uh, it's so new though. And I'm sure we will find out more and more. Uh, about where we can, how we can best use them, who should use them, who should definitely stay away from them. Uh, but in my view, yeah, it's it's too new, especially for cancer patients, to think, okay, I'm still on my standard diet, but I heard ketones are really good, so let's throw them in. As you say, you know, they are if you add them on top of glucose. I mean, it is an energy molecule as well. Or people who think, you know, they can use them for weight loss and uh, it actually really inhibits lipolysis. So 
um, what really is the point there, you know? Uh, I think we have to be very smart uh, when, when we do use them. I know somebody who uses them for uh, preventing seizures and it works really well, but it's a very, very targeted approach. And um, But I, I think some people, they just throw them in re left, right and centre. And uh, I doubt that it really has any benefits. And I think for cancer patients, it could potentially be um, I don't want to say a bad thing, but you know, we, we do have some, I mean, it's animal studies and it was injected ketone levels. It wasn't ingested, um, ketone body, sorry. Uh, but it did show that um, they were able to, the ketones were actually able to, to feed the, the cancer cells. So, you know, the question is, because that was added on top of um, a standard diet, you know, what happens there? Um, it's then it is a, a different situation situation than somebody who is fat adapted or who is naturally in ketosis, and then adding them in might definitely have a place, or they might definitely have a place in um, chemotherapy. So Adrian Sheck and her team in um, uh, their uh, Barrow Neurological Institute they're doing lots of research into this, and that's when it could have a role. Uh, but self-experimentation with exogenous ketones, please not, especially not as cancer patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah really good advice. Mm. Uh, what about MCT oil? Yeah, I do yeah. use MCT oils um, sometimes if somebody needs to get into ketosis. Say, um, I was just talking to somebody yesterday who has two radiotherapy sessions next week and uh, um, the oncologist would like uh, him to be in ketosis for those two sessions. And then, you know, it can be a good supplement to actually enhance um, the effects and get into deeper ketosis. Um, so, yeah, that's that's when it can have a good place. Definitely. Right. Truly really ramp that up a little bit. And, and so yeah. just briefly, if people are, are wondering, like, why would you want to be in ketosis before radiation? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's very interesting. I mean, there's um, the papers by Reiner Clement and uh, Colin Champ. Um, they're really, really interesting. So they explain what exactly all the, the mechanisms are. Uh, but it, it is all about also, you know, um, the, the, the glucose. Well, glucose levels, they do tend to, to go down um, if somebody is in, in ketosis and that definitely has an impact also if somebody is on, on chemo or radio, so um, the, the glucose can actually rescue cancer cells and fix the free radical, uh, the damage that has been done by radiotherapy and chemo that we want. I mean, that's, that's what we want to achieve with radio and chemotherapy. And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting, all the, all the different um, mechanisms that, you know, when, when ketone bodies are elevated, and especially also then when somebody is um, well oxygenated, that um, it only works well, radiotherapy only works well with um, oxygen and or it's, it's more effective. And so, yeah, it's, it's a, a good paper actually with it shows all the different um, mechanisms when, when ketone bodies are, are high and how radiotherapy can, can be more effective. That's brilliant. So mm. I kind of liken it, and I could be wrong in, in the thinking process, but ketone bodies will help like non-cancerous cells survive better in that context, but the weaker cells kind of starve out and are yeah. more susceptible to the damage. Is that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it, it's also protection of, um, of the healthy tissue mm. is, is also um, a factor. And, and then, yeah, making, making cancer cells more susceptible, more, more vulnerable to the, the treatment. And um, I've seen it, you know, sort of in N equal one with uh, clients who are fasting and um, who are doing all these things before and also after chemo. With radiation, interestingly, I have a, a bit less um, experience. It was because it, uh, that patient was referred by the oncologist and uh, it'll be interesting how, how it's going for, for him. Uh, but, you know, as, as I saw myself, it's radiation can have quite a lot of side effects on, on the healthy tissue. And that's certainly one, one aspect. And anybody who's done the, you know, fasting or even if it's just like ketosis uh, for chemotherapy, um, they've done really well on it. So, but I wouldn't recommend doing it as a DIY job. Mm -hmm. Work with someone <laughs> and, like yourself. Uh, yeah, and I always, um, I really prefer working with people where the oncologist is, is behind it as well. And then we can work together. Yes. And thank goodness, you know, in, in the States, that's becoming definitely more common than 
say, you know, three, four years ago, uh, that would have been unheard of mm-hmm. that I get uh, somebody referred. And, and now it's, you know, it's slowly but surely. That's brilliant. <laughs> it's, it is starting, yeah. yeah. And is it different cancer, different oncologists or different specialists that lend or tend to be more open-minded mind, about the ketogenic diet? Like more brain neurologic or is it systemic? What have you found? Yeah, it's, it's definitely... Mm, the most evidence is, is still for brain and I think in my case as well the eye is almost like an extension yeah. of the brain that's probably why it, it worked so well in my case and also because the retina is a tissue that is very uh, glucose glucose avid uh, so yeah it's it's definitely that's where we have the the most evidence I think in, in brain and also that's related to epilepsy and all the evidence that we have for that um, and that's really it's very strong I mean that's uh, a, a really approved clinical protocols and in in other areas but you know Colin Champ for instance he specializes in in breast um, breast cancer so it's not not necessarily brain and uh, but we definitely have to you know really find out a lot more which cancers or which types of cancer because I'm convinced there's there's, there's nuances there that um, some cancers will respond a lot less to a ketogenic diet than others. Uh, but definitely during treatment, I think for me, you know, it's, it's something every oncologist should, should consider. Mm-hmm. And we also see all the research that is coming out uh, from Walter Longo's group. And uh, I, I think that's regardless of the type of cancer. But then afterwards, they might go off and go back to a much more moderate approach again and uh, that might be you know what's sort of in the future what's coming that it's a really good complement to uh, to uh, com- um, chemo and radiation therapy to just mitigate all the side effects and um, hopefully make the treatments more effective and more tolerable uh, I think that's that's really the what we have to focus on at the moment and then afterwards it really depends on the type of cancer yeah, really good advice. Oh, this has been brilliant. I think people are really going to enjoy this, Patricia. Um, any? We have a few final questions that are a little bit more personal, kind of fun. But anything that you, you know, that you're excited about right now when it comes to cancer or athletics or ketosis that we didn't really talk about that you want to share? Um, yeah, I think I, I did mention sort of the. Uh, the main areas actually when we talked about exogenous ketones I think for athletes they could be really um, could be very exciting Uh, I'm sure they're gonna get banned fairly soon (laughs) Um, but you know I I definitely follow that research a lot and I think the only thing we haven't touched upon at all is um, is weight weight Mm -hmm. management weight loss and I'd love to you know, do more research and, and see or find almost like a formula who, you know, should do a low carb or ketogenic approach, even if it's just, you know, for a few weeks. And uh, I actually interestingly saw that with, with my husband because he obviously was forced to eat the same as me. And his GP had, had just told him that he, he should lose a bit of weight. And uh, I mean, he literally, he lost the weight really rapidly and it wasn't necessarily strict keto, but it was definitely low carb. Mm. And uh, he did it only for, you know, maybe two, three months. And, um, and he's, he stayed really slim now. So um, I think it can, be, it can be a brilliant tool. We just, I think sometimes we have to really find out, okay, who is it appropriate for? and who might do better on another approach but I think it's such a huge issue especially here in Ireland it's massive literally Mm -hmm. Uh, really big issue and how to you know get a handle on it also with children Um, and I think that's when you know uh, that's something that excites me as well that this could be um, a brilliant tool one of the tools. Totally. I think Lucia Ronica and that group at Stanford, they're, they're teasing that out with the A to Z study and looking at different genetic and epigenetic markers to see, you know, mm. whether it's low carb, high carb, exactly, you know, yeah. to, the, yeah. the, the, to suss out the responders from the non-responders mm. and to yeah. look at maybe the epigenetics and genomic variances there to see like, okay, well, just like we talked about different cancer subtypes, like it could it be that there's different obesity subtypes, you know, I from the convinced. stress and, and yeah. the toxins and the <laughs> microbiome, and like there's all these components. And yeah. so obviously, you know, if a dietary 
insulin issue is a main concern or or the etiology the cause of that obesity then obviously the ketogenic diet would be very applicable in that context right for weight loss but and there's other issues maybe early life trauma epigenetics uh, psychosocial stress things like that mm. maybe maybe other components would would work better but mm, yeah i like that totally. you really that you're bringing that out that it's it, that it's individual you know and that the ketogenic yeah. diet is not the the hammer for every no, single it's male a tool. yeah one tool right <laughs> exactly it's uh, i think for a nutritional therapist it should be one tool in the toolbox and i think for lots of people it's a short-term intervention even for epileptic children they use it for for two years and then more or less it depends a little bit and then they try to wean the child off and it's probably similar, you know, with maybe we shouldn't be constantly in ketosis. You know, that's that's the big question as well. Um, is it better to, you know, maybe go with the seasons and uh, come out a bit and then go back in and just have this flexibility? I think that's what ultimately, once you've regained your health, that's what ultimately it is about. Mm -hmm. I mean, it makes sense that our ancestors kind of did that, right? I mean, if mm. if you're hunting and gathering and there's blueberries, you're not gonna be like, well, I need to stay keto and have those blueberries, right? <laughs> yeah. Kind of thing. So yeah, it makes sense. I, 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 that seasonality, you know, when there's the availability of carbohydrates, it seems that humans would naturally kind of eat them more. Mm. So yeah. interesting that you bring that up. I think just to get people's mind churning to like, live with the seasons, be intuitive, like these are all things mm. that we, we can kind of talk about. I think about. for healthy people who just want to, you know, stay healthy and they don't have any, you know, chronic disease, uh, then I think that's definitely, that's the approach. And um, for chronic diseases, sometimes it really needs to be a short intervention. And then, you know, once once you're back on track, hopefully you can go back to a more relaxed approach as well. I mean, that would be the goal. That that's, right. I think it's not being on a strict regime forever. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would be just mentally as well, would be very yeah. hard. Yeah, you feel mm. like you're not really living life. Yeah, mm. you're kind of living life like a prescription. You're taking yeah, medicine, right? Exactly. You want to have that freedom to be yeah. able to be creative and, and change things. And not, not just involved. metabolic flexibility, yeah. but general <laughs> flexibility and freedom. Yeah, exactly. Love it, love yeah. it. Uh, so one of the final questions that I test every guest is your favorite herb, nutrient, or botanical. So if there's just one thing, you're stranded on a desert island, vitamin D and omega-3s are covered, what substance or food or supplement, for example, are you bringing with you? Oh, that's a good one. Um, what would I bring with me? <laughs> mm, I struggle a bit with um, B vitamins sometimes, so <laughs> that's sort of my, um, I think they tick quite a lot of boxes if that's one supplement. Um, yeah, that's what, what, what I pr probably would, would take with me. Um, if it's, or a herb, I don't know. You would have a very clean lifestyle there. So yeah, it would probably be B vitamins to keep keep the energy up. <laughs> yeah, so like active B12, active folate, things along yeah, those lines. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But that's me because I struggle with those. Uh -huh. A lot of people, right? <laughs> the, the MTHFR SNP is so pervasive, like 50% of the population. So mm. high hit right there. I like that tip. Uh, so what about your morning routine? We know very successful people. You've wrote this great book. You're educating a lot of clients, making you know, big changes, sweeping changes in the mentality of, of dietitians and, and uh, oncologists and cancer patients. What's the first couple hours of your day look like? Okay, when I get up, I have to first priority is my kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they have to get ready. So it really is fairly busy. Um, I don't have much time before that I get up and get them out of bed. <laughs> And uh, I make a point not to look at my phone, um, which, is, which is hard. And I did that for a long time, but that's uh, a thing that I am really trying to stay away from. And then uh, once they're in school, uh, either I bring them and then I do a walk and, uh, and then do my the five Tibetan rites. And uh, if my husband brings them to school, then I do my trampolining. Um, and I often listen to podcasts cool. <laughs> during that time. So that's 10, 15 minutes. And then I do the five Tibetan rides. I really always, I, I do them. And you can do them anywhere, even if you have a tiny amount of space only. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, they just, I just really like them. That's uh, awesome. So that's, that's pretty much me. And then it's off to work. Work. And yeah. then kind of the later breakfast sometimes or skip it? Yeah, then I, I usually generally eat sort of um, 11, 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Cool. 
Brilliant. Love it. So if you're uh, in an elevator or a lift with a parliament member, a politician, someone from the World Health Organization, they said, Patricia, you know, we know you're very involved in nutrition and oncology and cancer and so forth. What sort of uh, policy or, or some sort of um, message should we convey to the, to the public at large uh, during that lift 30 second ride? What would you want them to kind of know about so that it's on the back of their mind when they're making decisions about food, nutrition, diet, toxins, and so on? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest problem in, in the field we're in is not having enough money for the research. And uh, I think if I had a politician, <laughs> but uh, that's probably a bit um, not quite not quite the point. But um, yeah, definitely just I think being fast at implementing new things. I think it's just governments. Um, it is very rigid. There's lots of lobby groups and trying to somehow yeah, really focus more on on what is going on, the the science at the moment. And I, I mean, if I was in politics, I probably would, I would probably know why it's so hard. There must be a reason why everything takes so long yeah. to actually be be implemented and and for change uh, to to actually happen. But you know, that's something uh, that I I find the biggest the biggest pain point: how long it takes for new research. To actually get through into new policy guidelines, I mean, it's pretty years, uh, <laughs> if not decades. <laughs> oh, it's sh shocking, right? I yeah. Mean, recently, the American Diabetes Association on their website was recommending a bagel and orange juice for breakfast, mm. and just all this stuff is unbelievable. Like that would be the diet to induce diabetes. I mean, in my mm. eyes, mm. yeah. And, yeah. But even that, um, it, kind of even the bench to bedside approach is, you know, the translating of the research takes a while. Yeah. And some practitioners exactly. aren't even aware of their own journal, whether it's endocrinology or hepatology or what have you. So it's a, it's a, that's why these podcasts and videos, people like yourself that are writing books and influencing the masses, which now we can download these things on PubMed and go to our practitioners mm. and be armed with the data. Yeah, so that's, yeah that's exactly. Brilliant. Yeah, I think the online world is it's wonderful. It can be also very mm -hmm. frustrating, confusing and overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, we've dealt with a few of the dietitians uh, on Twitter, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but it's it's definitely, you know, getting the debate going and uh, I think all this will be a grassroots movement. You yeah. know, it's not going to come from the top down. It's, it's the bottom up approach, I think. That's I what I believe in, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Patricia, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I'm yeah, thanks so much for, for having me. Your knowledge, your wisdom, and just you know the courage of like sharing this information. It's very controversial and, and can be polarizing. Mm. So, yeah. commend you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. If folks want to <laughs> connect with you online, how can they do that? Uh, my website, patriciadaily.com, and I also have uh, ketoforyou.com, and I'm actually working on uh, launching a new membership. Cool. Um, with my sort of previous courses but it's going to be a lot more open and not just uh, it's not necessarily cancer focused it's just really um, ketogenic education awesome brilliant yeah. and that'll be on your website patriciadaily.com yeah okay. yeah exactly that's it's daily without an i yeah yeah okay right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome all right friends well i really appreciate you tuning in i hope you like this video i'll put all the links and uh, associated studies that we discussed in the show notes in the youtube description below if you liked it please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and i appreciate you tuning in